It's really cold in Dallas, as you can tell by my outfit, and it's just a few days before Christmas, but the show must go on. So in this video, I'm identifying and discussing my 25 top wines from 2022. These are not new releases, unlike some of the top 100 lists that I've been reviewing. Rather, these are just the wines that I thought were the absolute best wines that I've enjoyed during this calendar year. There's going to be a mix of wines, including red wines, white wines, sparkling wines, and even some dessert wine. So let's get started. Coming in at number 25 is the 2009 Promontory Napa Valley Bordeaux Blend. This is just the second release for this highly acclaimed wine. Like Harlan Estate, this is one of Bill Harlan's projects. The fruit for this wine comes from a largely undeveloped area along Oakville's southwestern ridge. This wine was concentrated, rich, and powerful. It remains incredibly structured despite its age. Even after a three-hour decant, this wine kept evolving and improving the longer that it was open. Descriptors included black fruit, scorched earth, wet rock, menthol, tobacco, and licorice. It reminded me a little bit of a young La Mission Aubryon. As enjoyable as this wine was at the end of that evening, the next day it was even better. If you have these in your cellar, I would definitely give them a few more years, as they'll definitely continue to improve with additional time in the bottle. As is often the case, the next wine in the top 25 countdown was presented to me blind at my wine club. Due to the high acidity and still grippy tannins, I was guessing that this wine was from Tuscany. Descriptors included mixed black and red fruit, thyme, black olives, leather, and forest floor. While I ultimately guessed Tignanello, this wine was the 1997 Sasakaya. Based on my experience with this pristine bottle, this wine has a long life ahead of it, and if I had some in my collection, I would definitely let it have further bottle aging before I started digging in. Interestingly, Sasakaya was originally sold as a table wine because it did not meet the strict appellation requirements in Tuscany at the time. That was so because it did not include indigenous varietals. Instead, there was a large percentage of Cabernet Sauvignon in this wine. Nevertheless, these super Tuscan wines have become so popular that Bulgari ultimately received its own DOC, and additionally, now Sasakaya even has its own dedicated DOC. What a difference a year makes. While the 1995 Mutan I tasted earlier this year still had a slight austerity to it with some dryness in the tannins, the 1996 Chateau Mouton Rothschild was completely different and is the next wine in my top 25 countdown. Initially tight, the 1996 Chateau de Mouton Rothschild just blew up with two to three hours of air. This wine was opulent and concentrated with a purple hue. Descriptors included blackberry, black plum, menthol, tobacco, pencil lead, cedar, graphite, and forest floor. This was a sultry, seductive wine that was thoroughly enjoyable. If you're trying to decide between opening a 1995 or a 1996 Mouton, definitely go with the 96 and be sure to give this one two to three hours of air before you start digging in. Coming in at number 22 in my top 25 wines of 2022 is the 1995 Chateau Aubryon. This pristine bottle of 1995 Aubryon was an absolute showstopper. This wine stood out amongst some formidable competition, namely the 1995 Mouton and the 1995 Lascasse. While those two wines still had a slight austerity, this wine was definitely vibrant and expressive, and very, very pleasant. Descriptors included an enticing blend of blackberry, plum, tobacco, graphite, cedar, gravel, forest floor, and hints of smoke and violet. Truly a world-class, elegant wine. I sometimes use car analogies in my tasting notes, and this 1995 Oprion was Mercedes S-Class all the way. The tannins were subtle and perfectly balanced by ample acidity. The finish was long and complex. Even a small taste lingered on your palate for well over a minute. I will warn you, however, that this wine is enjoyable on pop and pour. I would resist the temptation to start drinking it too quickly after it's opened, as it does improve greatly with an hour or two of air time. The next wine in the top 25 wines of 2022 is the 1999 Salon Blanc de Blanc Champagne. 
As its name suggests, this champagne is 100% Chardonnay. Better still, this Chardonnay comes from Le Menil, which is arguably the top source for Chardonnay in all of Champagne. After fermentation, the Salon spends an incredible 10 years on the lees before it's released. While these efforts would undoubtedly produce a top Champagne on a regular basis, Salon is only produced in truly outstanding vintages. To date, there have only been about 40 different bottlings of Salon ever produced. When it is produced, the quantities of Salon are also very minuscule by Champagne standards. Only about 50 to 60,000 bottles, and that's bottles, not cases. Compare this with Dom Perignon, for example, which produces at least 10 times that amount in most vintages. And in fact, in some vintages, Dom Perignon produces more than 1 million bottles of a particular vintage. This outstanding champagne featured a complex combination of lemon, lime, ginger, brioche, almond, biscuit, and chalk. It had a creamy mouthfeel and incredibly long finish. I hadn't tried this champagne for about 18 months, and it's definitely softened in that time period. While this champagne does not reach the heights of epic vintages such as 1996 or 2002, it's extremely impressive, and it's one that's drinking extremely well right now. So you can feel good about opening this one while you continue to let your 1996 and 2002 Salon continue to age in the bottle. The next wine in my top 25 wines of 2022 is the wine that I selected to help celebrate the passage of my level four WSET diploma earlier this year. Namely, the 1946 Bodega Toro Albala Don PX Convento Selección Pedro Jimenez. And in fact, I still saved the original wooden case with the dead soldier inside for sentimental reasons, of course. And I even have a little bit of this very special wine left in this test tube that I'll enjoy sometime soon. What makes this wine so special? Well, for one thing, it was produced from the very first grapes that were harvested following World War II in Montillo Mariles. Following harvest, the already very ripe grapes were laid out in the sun to further concentrate and intensify the flavors and sugars. Thereafter, this wine was pressed and then aged for decades in oak casks. And in fact, it wasn't even bottled until 2013. When it was bottled, it was bottled directly from the oak cask without any fining or filtration. This was an extraordinarily complex wine that was fascinating to experience. When I poured it into the glass, it almost looked like I was pouring mortar oil. It's very thick and viscous. It has 17% alcohol by volume, but it's actually surprisingly light and elegant given that ABV percentage. It's sweet, but it's not cloyingly sweet, and there's abundant acidity to help balance the sweetness. Descriptors were almost too numerous to count, and every time you went back to the glass, you identified something new. They included raisin, fig, date, black cherry, black raspberry, Cinnamon, dark chocolate, balsamic, mocha, Christmas spice cake, black olive, lemongrass, and many, many more. If you have not yet tried a top expression of Pedro Jimenez, I highly recommend it. Compared with other collectible wines, these are surprisingly affordable, and you can get a piece of history for a small fraction of what you could get with other top wines. And better still, these wines are tremendously age-worthy, and even this wine from 1946 is extremely youthful and extraordinarily complex. In 1964, Lyndon Baines Johnson was the president of the United States. Mary Poppins was the movie that was topping the box office charts. The top song was I Want to Hold Your Hand by the Beatles. And the grapes for the outstanding 1964 Gaia Barbaresco were harvested. The 1964 Gaia Barbaresco is the next wine in my top 25 wines of 2022. The first thing I noticed about this wine was how light the color was. Color-wise, it almost reminded me of a rosé from Tavel. This wine was extraordinarily complex, however, and it kept evolving in the glass. Dried sour cherries, dried violets, leather, truffle, hoisin, earth, and tar were all apparent. Despite its age, the tannins were still noticeable, but the tannins and the flavors were balanced by ample acidity. It's always a treat to taste well-aged Nebbiolo, and this was certainly no exception. Another iconic Italian producer comes in at number 18 in my top 25 wines of 2022. 
Earlier this year, I had the chance to visit Beyond Di Santi, and while I was there, I had a lunch with a tasting flight that included three Beyond Di Santi reservas, 1985, 2004, and 2015. The reservas are only produced in outstanding vintages. I was expecting to enjoy the 1985 most, as that's an outstanding vintage, and I'm usually drawn to wines that have a little bit more age on them due to their complexity. 1985 was extremely complex. However, this 2004 was so incredibly expressive and vibrant, it absolutely blew up in the glass. And so this wine was ultimately my favorite of the flight of the reservas that I had at Biondi Santi. You should be able to still find this one in the secondary market, and it's gone a little bit under the radar, and so you could get it for much less than a wine like the 1985, for example. It's definitely one that I would highly recommend, and if you have this wine, there's certainly no harm in opening it now, as it's extremely impressive and incredibly enjoyable at this time. Of course, there's no rush, and it certainly will continue to improve and gain complexity with age, but it is in a terrific spot right now. If you're interested in wine recommendations, wine collecting strategies, and learning more about wine, please do subscribe to my channel. I've been collecting wine for more than 15 years and also have a level 4 diploma from the WSET. So I have both formal certification as well as substantial practical knowledge from the School of Hard Knocks. For those of you who are new to my channel, these are not all wines that were in my collection. In many instances, my friends and I have wine tastings where we each contribute a wine and then we'll taste seven or eight outstanding wines a night. Or in some instances, we'll pool our money together and purchase wines for a tasting. So at one point earlier this year, we assembled a four vintage vertical of Lynch Bage from Outstanding Vintages. We have the 1961, the 1982, and the 1989 and 1990, which we tasted side by side. All four of these wines were showing extremely well, and any one of them could have been wine of the night on most nights. On this night, two of the vintages rose to the top, the 1961 and the 1990. Both of these wines were very different, however. The 1990 was opulent and flamboyant and extremely impressive. This wine was one that I would never would have guessed was 32 years old had I tasted it blind. If I was tasting all four of these wines blind, I might choose this one as my favorite just because it was so enjoyable and vibrant. 1961 was a legendary vintage in Bordeaux, and it was particularly strong in Poyac, which is where this impressive 1961 Lynchbage is from. While most 1961s are mere novelties at this point, this impressive Lynchbage still had plenty of life left and was actually a very, very legitimate wine and showing extraordinarily well. It was certainly less concentrated than the 1990, given three additional decades of bottle age, but it was silky and elegant and extraordinarily complex. These wines are certainly very worthy of their spots in my top 25 wines of 2022. Another one of our wine tasting themes this year centered around the 2004 Loire Village wines. Loire is certainly one of the best Burgundy producers, but 2004 was an extraordinarily difficult vintage. As a result, Loire made the difficult decision to declassify all the Grand Cru and Premier Cru fruit, and to put that fruit in the village wines. We ultimately purchased all three of the village wines that Loire produced in 2004 and did a side-by-side -side comparison tasting. Two of those Burgundies made my top 25 wines of 2022, including the outstanding Gevry Chambertin. Initially reticent, this wine gained weight and some expressiveness with some exposure to air after it was poured in the glass. As is customary with Loire, this wine was extraordinarily complex and had tremendous purity of fruit. Descriptors included sour cherry, raspberry, cranberry, rose petal, violet, earth, and mixed spice. There was abundant acidity and the finish was mind-blowingly long, more than 60 seconds. Chateau Angelus is located in Saint-Emilion in Bordeaux's right bank and has been producing outstanding wines since at least 1989. The 1990 Chateau Angelus finished number 15 in my top 25 wines of 2022. This wine is a blend that includes 60% Merlot and 40% Cabernet Franc. This is a full-bodied, powerful wine from Bordeaux's right bank. It featured layers of flavor, impressive depth, and an incredibly long finish. This is definitely a wine that's at peak now, 
but there's no rush to drink it, and it will still cruise in the cellar for another decade or two. This 1990 Angelus was the best wine that Angelus made until at least the 2000 vintage, and then was quickly followed by outstanding efforts in 2003 and 2005. According to Sir Winston Churchill, a magnum of champagne is the perfect size for two gentlemen to enjoy over lunch, especially if one of them is not drinking. Notwithstanding this sage advice from Sir Winston Churchill, there were 12 of us who enjoyed an impressive three-liter bottle, or Jeroboam, of 1988 Paul Roger Cuvée Winston Churchill Champagne over dinner earlier this year. Made only in top vintages by Paul Roger, the Cuvée Winston Churchill is prepared in honor of Sir Winston Churchill, mindful of the qualities that he sought in his champagne. For that reason, only Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are used, so there's no Meunier. Better still, this fruit is sourced exclusively from Grand Cru vineyards and from vineyards that were under vine when Churchill was still alive. In the large format, the 1988 Paul Roger Winston Churchill was incredibly fresh and vibrant. Descriptors included baked red apple, toast, lemon, brioche, and biscuit. Oxidative notes such as caramel were barely discernible. On the palate, this champagne displayed lots of complexity, ample acidity, a creamy texture, and a long, complex finish. How do I know that Winston Churchill would have approved of this wine? Another one of his quotes gives us the answer to that. He once said, My tastes are simple. I am easily satisfied with the best. The number 13 wine in my top 25 wines of 2022 is the 2001 Penfolds Grange. This wine was so youthful and vibrant, it almost seems to be aging in reverse, like Benjamin Button. Dominant descriptors included blackberry, black cherry, blueberry, and plum. These dark fruit flavors were complemented by savory spices, leather, and eucalyptus. This wine took several hours to open up, but once it did, it coated your palate with protracted, robust flavors and a long finish that lasted close to 45 seconds. There's definitely no rush on this wine, as it still has plenty of life ahead of it. If you still have this one in your cellar, I would definitely wait to open this one. Next up in my top 25 wines of 2022 is the 1991 Soldera Brunello di Montalcino. This wine is, of course, 100% Sangiovese. Even though this wine is more than 30 years old, it benefited from an 8-hour decant. And we were actually able to open this one at noon so that we can enjoy it at an appropriate time in the evening. Oxymoronically, this wine is somehow both intensely concentrated, yet light and elegant. This is a sensation that I sometimes describe as intensely ethereal. Descriptors for this wine included red cherry, raspberry, dried rose petals, leather, earth, and brown sugar. On the palate, this wine had a velvety texture and layer after layer of complex flavors. Everything was in perfect harmony, and the finish was long and intense. A stunning wine, and one that truly deserves its spot on my top 25 wines of 2022. One interesting side note about this producer, Soldera had a strict no-spitting policy when people visited the winery to taste the wines. Anyone who violated this policy was immediately thrown out. Needless to say, I would be in no danger of violating this policy. While many 1982 Bordeaux can be a bit of a crapshoot at this juncture, the 1982 Ducru Bocayou has been consistently outstanding on several occasions this year. Each of these bottles was from an ex chateau release that occurred not long ago. And this pristine provenance has really made a big difference for each of these bottles. Descriptors for this outstanding wine included red currant, red plum, tobacco, cedar, forest floor, and mixed spice. This is a full-bodied wine, but one that is silky smooth with integrated tannins and a long, complex finish. A stunning wine that is in a perfect place right now if you get one of these ex-chateau release bottles.